Hey, so I'm Matt Schoener, uh, and I'm going to be talking about the evolution of reduced dependence on parental care uh, in experimental populations with very few. So, um, in, in animal families, the social interactions that occur as offspring are developing uh, create the environmental context in which, which those, those individuals develop. And this can have important consequences for offspring phenotype. And we study these social interactions for two different reasons. Uh, the first and probably most obvious is that the social interactions that occur within a family can influence the development of offspring phenotype. And this is probably most obvious uh, in species like berry beetles or pasture birds where young depend on resources that are provided to them by their parents, and there can be intense competition between dependent young for parental supplied resources. And the level of this competition can affect things like growth rate, which ultimately can affect fitness. The second reason why we're interested in these social interactions is that they can be a source of selection, and then they, they can also themselves evolve. And one way to see this is to consider a really simple model of parent offspring co-adaptation, which I'm showing you right here. So in a simple model, we can imagine that the fitness of offspring is determined by two traits. One trait is expressed in the offspring, and this could be something like the begging behavior of the offspring. And the other trait uh, is expressed in the parent, and this could be parental provisioning behavior. So selection on offspring can result in, in changes in traits expressed in offspring, as well as traits expressed in parents, and ultimately this can result in the establishment of a genetic correlation between the two. So there can be a correlation between offspring begging and parental provisioning behavior that's due to correlate, correlational selection on those traits. And so the way that this has been studied mostly is through quantitative genetic experiments that have actually uh, used breeding designs to estimate the genetic correlation between traits expressed in offspring like begging and then parental provisioning. And once we know the, uh, the direction of this correlation, we can then infer how selection has acted on parents or offspring uh, in the past. So we've been studying sort of co-adaptation from a slightly different perspective. And what we've been doing is manipulating one component, we've been manipulating the possibility for parental provisioning over evolutionary time scales, and ultimately we want to ask how manipulating that influences the evolution of traits expressed in offspring, as well as traits expressed in parents that both influence offspring fitness. And so we've been doing this uh, in this, this wonderful species, Necropolis vespaloides, which has become a model for studying uh, the evolution and genetics of parental care. Uh, and as Ben talked about earlier, breeding in this species relies on a vertebrate carcass, usually a small mammal or a bird. Um, and it consists of two main components. There's a pre-hatching uh, stage of parental care and a post-hatching stage of parental care. And I'm going to show you just a very brief video, which will be the only behavior in this talk, of pre-hatching care. So a pair of beetles will find a mouse, and then over the course of about three days, they prepare this carcass, and here the beetles are doing this very quickly. Uh, this is three days compressed into about 45 seconds. So they shave the fur feathers from the carcass. They also, interestingly, pull the gut out of the beetle, or out of the, the mouse. Then they roll it into a ball, and they, sh they smear the surface of it with an antimicrobial exudates. And all the while they're doing this, the pair are mating and the females laying eggs in the soil surrounding the carcass. So after this pre-hatching stage, uh, the, the larvae hatch, and then they crawl to the carcass. And the larvae are capable of self-feeding. So here are the larvae uh, eating on the carcass. Um, but when the parent comes to the carcass, the larvae engage in, in begging behaviors. Uh, so here's, here's a parent, and when uh, he or she arrives, the larvae will rear up and put their mouths to the parent's mouth, and the parent will regurgitate pre-digested carrion into the, the begging mouths of these larvae. So this is kind of very similar to a pastor and bird, which is something that you're probably more familiar with. So one of the reasons why, or sorry, let me go back. So parent bearing beetles can influence the fitness of their offspring through both the genes they transmit as well as the environments that they provide for their offspring. And there are three major environmental components that parents determine. So first, uh, they can influence the environment through, sorry, my pointer's not working anymore. Oh, there it is. Through investment in eggs, also through uh, carcass preparation, as well as through uh, post-hatching corrective care. And what's, what's really useful about this system is that you can remove post-hatching care experimentally and ask how it affects fitness. Uh, and so lots of experiments have been done like this since the late 90s, and what these show is that parental care is good for offspring, right? So these are just some cartoons showing some typical results. So we have no care, uh, or sorry, full care versus no care here. And when beetles get full care, breeding success is higher, larval density, which is a measure of brood size, is higher, um, and mean larval mass is also higher than when they receive uh, no post-hatching care. So parental care is generally good. 
So what we've been doing uh, is, a, is basically experimental evolution where we've created two different environments for these beetles to experience. Uh, in one environment, which I'm going to call no care, we remove parents um, after the carcass has been prepared and the clutch has been completed, but before the eggs hatch. So in, in this case, all of the lar there are no interactions between the parents and their offspring, so there's no post-hatching parental care at all. And these larvae are on their own um, until, they, uh, until they close. Um, and then the other environment, which is our control environment, the parents remain in the breeding box with the larvae for the entire larval period. And this allows the full scope of interactions between parents and the new young. And so the ultimate goal of this experiment is to, to see how uh, adaptation to these two different environments affects the genetic uh, correlation between parental and offspring behaviors. And we're not quite there yet, so what I'm going to describe today are uh, phenotypic changes that have occurred over 13 generations uh, uh, of this experiment. And I'm going to focus on three different traits. The first is breeding success. And breeding success is uh, just a portion of pairs of beetles that we set up that actually produce dispersing larvae. So it's sort of a measure of larval survival. Uh, also larval density, which is brood size divided by the mass of the carcass. And we use the same size carcass every generation, so it's really, um, it's really just brood size. And then mean larval mass and dispersal. So for each of these, I'm just going to describe how they've, they've changed over the last 13 generations. And so uh, the first thing that we found is that breeding success has increased dramatically in the no-care lines over the first 13 generations of the experiment. So here on the Y is just the breeding success as a portion of pairs that we set up that actually produce dispersing larvae. And on the X here is uh, just, just the generation. Uh, the control lines in all these will be in blue, and the no-care lines will be in red. The first thing I want to point out is that in the control lines, breeding success is, is really high. It's typically over, the, over 80%. And it bounces around from generation to generation, but there's no directional change here. Uh, but in both of the control lines, breeding success initially was quite low, it was around 35% at the beginning of the experiment, and it's increased. In generation 13, uh, it's between 65 and 70%. So it appears that there's been adaptation to this uh, no care environment, and breeding success uh, has, has increased as part of that. So the second thing we looked at was uh, larval density. So this is just the, the number of larvae per gram uh, of carcass. And so this is sort of a measure of how well larvae uh, are able to survive and make use of the, the carcass that the parents prepared. And uh, so here's, uh, again, in the blue are the control lines. And you can see that the, the larval density bounces around considerably, but there's no change over, no directional change over time. In contrast, in both uh, replicates of the experiment, uh, larval density has increased in, um, in the no-pair lines. And this suggests, again, that brood size is getting larger uh, as, these, as these populations adapt to the absence of, of post-hatching parental care. So in a, a, a paper that we published last year, we found that the relationship between mean larval mass and larval density uh, in the no-care environment is this sort of strange hump-shaped relationship. But the important thing for this talk is that uh, at densities between one larva per gram and two larvae per gram, we should see a, a decline in uh, larval mass as density shifts that way. And so we've been seeing density increase in the no care line. So we actually expect to see a phenotypic change in larval mass that tracks it that's driven by the fact that there are more larvae competing for resources on the carcass. Uh, and this is just illustrating this point. So as we shift from a density of around one, which was what it was in generation one, to uh, almost two, which is what it was in 13, we should see this decline. But when we look at that, we find that there's absolutely no change in larval mass over time. So here's just mean larval mass in these lines across 13 generations. Um, the full pair lines, the control lines, are always producing heavier larvae, and this makes sense because having parents is good. Um, but uh, the no pair lines, there's, there's, there actually has not been a decrease in larval mass. Even the larval density has been increasing. And so this is something that we've been, that we've been trying to understand. Uh, and one thing that I want to suggest today is that, that larval mass may actually be increasing, but it's increasing in a way that, that is cryptic because density is also increasing. So again, we can just look at this hump-shaped relationship between larval density and mean larval mass. Again, at the beginning of the experiment, uh, we had jet, uh, density was around one larvae per gram. But what I want to suggest is that maybe the relationship between larval mass and density itself has actually evolved, and that this is masking any changes um, that we might be see, that, that we uh, might have seen. And so, what, the way this could happen is that this reaction norm, which I'm showing for generation one as a dashed line, actually just increases its height. Right? So they're producing lar larger larvae across a range of densities. 
But because density is also shifting, we're not going to see any change in mean larval mass at all across time. And so this shift in the reaction norm could be just because we're selecting in our environments for uh, increased self-feeding or something like that. So, so to look at that, uh, I've just plotted, I did this last week, so I've just looked at how mean, uh, mean larval mass against larval density in the first generation of the experiment. And this is the relationship in both of the, the replicate lines. So it's the same hump-shaped relationship that we described in, in the paper uh, last year. And what I wanted to look at was whether this relationship has changed. So I compared it to the relationship that we see in generation 13. And what we see is that there actually has been this shift. So it looks like it's been a shift in the, the uh, intercept of a reaction mode, essentially. So this is generation one here, and then this is generation 13 for the first set of replicate lines. So this is really clear uh, in, in the first set of replicate lines. We see the same pattern in the second replicate, uh, in the second replicate um, but the pattern is, is quite a bit messier, and the height change isn't uh, quite so extreme. Um, yeah, so, uh, so as I said, this is just sort of a progress report of an experiment that's going on, and we hope to continue uh, for quite a while. But I think, I, I hope that I convinced you that, that these populations are adapting to these, uh, these new, uh, this new environment. So I'll show you the breeding success and larval density both increase in the no care populations. And it looks like there's been this, in, this cryptic increase in mean larval mass. It's been masked by coincident shift in larval density. And, and the work that's ongoing now is trying to identify the adaptations in parents and their larvae that are allowing populations to adapt to this new care environment. And we're looking at things like how well the parents prepare the carcass before we remove them, uh, as well as things like how well the larvae self-feed. Um, and I think with that, I, I have time to take questions. Oh, well, actually, I'll, I'll just thank Ben Jarrett, Gary Bar, Becky Keller, and my co-authors. size of dispersal, right? So okay. it's after that, that period of time, right? So in our no-care environment, we're, you know, we, I say we're eliminating care, but we're actually eliminating all interactions between parents and their larvae. So the, the parents actually are not there anymore to, to eat versus start larvae if they yeah. want to. Um, and so it, it may not have worked. 